Hello and welcome to Next, People Science Tomorrow, and today, art. I love doing this series for Southern California Public Radio because I get to talk to the most wonderful people about topics that have fascinated me for years. I'm Matt Kaplan, the host of Next, here in the Crawford Family Forum at Southern California Public Radio. Uh, this afternoon, our topic today is a great example of what I just said, getting to talk to these terrific folks. Uh, I'll start with this, though. A very long time ago, the old Museum of Science and Industry. Anybody remember that before the California Science Center? It was my, my favorite museum in LA. Anyway, that old establishment in Exposition Park announced a special exhibit about the intersection of art and science. And I remember how excited I was when I learned about this show. It was already my favorite place to go in town. And I must have been about 12. I immediately made it clear to mom and dad, mom's over here, that I was going to be there. I had to attend this show. So I entered with the greatest of excitement, and a couple of hours later, my enthusiasm had deflated like the giant robotic ice pack that was part of the exhibit. And I thought, this is it? Uh, where was the soaring vision, the intricacy of nature, the artist's envisioning of life, the universe, and everything? And, and just one measly laser? Come on! So I thought a lot over the, years, uh, over the years, the ensuing decades, about what went wrong with that display. And as the years passed, I started to see artists who were getting it right. And then I started to meet scientists and engineers. Now, you know, here's the shock. It turns out that scientists and engineers like the arts. I mean, who'd have thought? So some of them, I discovered, even make art or music, or theater, or dance, or all of the above. We have one or two of those here today. The greatest revelation of all, these scientists artists appeared to be motivated to do both by something mysterious at the core of their being. And it's that motivation that I hope we can explore today as we learn about the lives and work of four truly fascinating individuals. The first of our guests is, she's pretty much one of those people I was just mentioning who has had a hand in uh, nearly every muse and a couple that the ancient Greeks never, never imagined. Uh, Dr. Crystal Dilworth is a neurochemist at the California Institute of Technology right up the street here in Pasadena. Caltech is also where she earned her PhD. A few of you may know her as a reporter on Techno for Al Jazeera America or as host of Fail Lab for the Discovery Channel Digital Network. Ah, but she is also a former professional dancer who trained at the Alvin Ailey School in New York. And uh, here's a shot of her in training up here. We'll jump to that. Yep. Dave, our tech guy, just zipped across the back of the theater there. So there she is uh, practicing. Crystal was also a nationally ranked rhythm, rhythmic gymnast and is still an accomplished violinist. And it was when she was an undergrad at UCSD, go Tritons over here, <laughs> that she decided that science, not dance, would be her career, though she has never stopped dancing. Please help me welcome Crystal Dilworth. <laughs> Have a seat, Crystal. Dave's gonna come around and adjust your microphone there in just a second. So, uh, listen, you, you in part make your living studying the brain nowadays. Do you ever marvel at how your own brain enabled you to pursue so many fields and, and talents? I don't think so. I think it was a scientific exploration of existence that sort of led me to all of those different things. I think we're all sort of scientists and artists and we ask questions about our world and this was just the path I chose. At least we start out that way. As my yeah. other boss, my day job boss, Bill Nye says, we're all scientists until yeah. about the fourth grade and we get it drilled out of us. But uh, some of us, you being a prime example, seem to have hung on to that. Well, I think when you say we get it drilled out of us, I think that's a misunderstanding of what it means to be a scientist and how scientists and how engineers go about sort of structuring their worlds. Because we all ask questions. We want to understand what's going on around us. We want to be involved in those processes. And that's what scientists do. We're going to talk a lot more about this intersection of science and art that Crystal is a, a good example of. But first, I'm going to get to our, our next guest, who is an old friend. Dr. Dan Durda and I regularly cross paths in the world of space science and exploration. 
me because my day job is a few blocks away at the Planetary Society, and Dan because he is a very accomplished planetary scientist at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. He's been my guest on Planetary Radio many times, talking about his research that has been conducted all over the world, and sometimes above it, in the cockpit of an F-18 fighter jet. I'm always happy to talk to him, but it's another profession of Dan's that got him on today's show, because Dan does things like this big image over our heads. That alien landscape is a creation of his own. Uh, it's called Mountaintop Twilight. So joining us today via Skype, please welcome Dan Durda. <laughs> Dan, you're looking great. Nice headset. Thank you. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and we can hear and see you fine. He can't see much. He just has this bad wide shot of uh, the four of us. <laughs> but I, I will tell you, you have the, the loveliest audience ever out here, Dan. Outstanding. Uh, great to be here in avatar form. <laughs> Speaking of avatar, which we may come back to later tonight, <laughs> tell us about this rather fanciful scene. Well, this, you know, this is an example of uh, what you know, really got me into planetary science in the first place. It's kind of ironic. I do asteroids these days for my, my day job mostly, but what really captured my attention um, in high school was this idea of exoplanets and, and life out there. And so um, that really you know, uh, fills my artwork, uh, even though I'm not doing numerically, you know, analytically research on these things. It, it's still it still captures my imagination, and so I feel just compelled when I do my artwork to, uh, to look at exoplanet scenes. So, uh, lucky you guys, you're going to see more of Dan's work in just a couple of minutes, uh, but I want to bring up somebody else now, and I should say that my boss at the Planetary Society, the, the science guy, he's an engineer, so I'm sure he will be very happy to hear that that vast collection of professions is, is also going to be represented on our stage today. The question, though, is, which Chuck Manning will we be talking to? Is it this guy who's going to pop up here in his micro devices laboratory at the Jet Propulsion Lab? That's uh, him there in the bunny suit off on the right. Or is it this cool LA jazz man making the joint jump? <laughs> Please welcome Chuck Manning. Hey, Chuck, thanks a lot. You, you kind of know what to do with a microphone, I yes. hope, right? Here comes Dave to help you out a little bit. I got the it. service here is outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm tempted to say, will the real Chuck Manning stand up? Which, which one of these images is more you? I, I don't know, but, you know, I'm really lucky to be able to do both. Yeah. And, you know, that's the thing is, you know, at this, this time we have now, uh, it's amazing that you can actually live in multiple worlds and have dual lives and we afford to be able to do that. And you can't actually have one without the other anymore because even musicians are technologists nowadays and, and, and uh, uh, there's a, such a creativity in engineering and science today. Crystal's nodding and you can't see it, but so is Dan over there on the big screen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're gonna talk uh, with Chuck and everybody else here in uh, another few minutes. I do want to ask him how Leonardo da Vinci ended up in his lab. You'll see how in a, in a few minutes. And, and I know you brought your sax along. It's not just here as eye candy, is it? You're going to yeah, play something for I'll us play later. something. Good. Okay. Our final guest this afternoon is a distinguished professor of chemistry at the University of California, Los Angeles. Before that, he was a group leader at IBM's famous Zurich Research Laboratory. And that's where he uh, did, he still does actually, but it's one of the places where he did pioneering research in nanoscale science and technology. Now he directs UCLA's Nano and Pico Characterization Core Facility of the California Nanosystems Institute. Easy for me to say. And he is principal investigator of a nanotechnology research center in Japan as well. So. Great science credentials, but Jim Jimsevsky may also have done a better job of integrating art directly with his science than anybody else on Earth. He is the scientific director of UCLA's Art Science Center, where he has worked for years with artist and co-director Victoria Vesna. Here's the quote you'll find on the homepage at Dr. Jimsevsky's personal website. I am enough of an artist to draw freely upon my imagination. Imagination is more important than knowledge. For knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, 
giving birth to evolution. That's what Albert Einstein said. Let's see what Jim Jimsefsky has to say. Please welcome Dr. Jimsefsky. And now we've got everybody. Uh, if we had one more chair up here, we might have brought up Jim's collaborator, Victoria Festo, who is sitting right over here. But maybe we can hear from her in a moment or two. Longtime artistic collaborator. Jim, the, the intersection of art and science appears to have many, many dimensions in your work. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a fair statement, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to show a small portion of a video that uh, this is not the artwork. This is, of course, just documenting uh, an installation which got quite a bit of attention called Blue Morph. And uh, first, though, I hope you can say something about how it represents your search for, for the music, or at least the rhythm, that seems to permeate all of nature. Yeah, well, I think all living things involve motion, you know, at the um, nanoscopic level, the microscopic level. Everything is in motion, otherwise we'd be dead, basically. And this piece is based on the metamorphosis of a uh, chrysalis forming a butterfly, and we actually record the motion of the, as the, all these organs are, you know, they go from the caterpillar into the butterfly over a period of about one week. And so we recorded all that motion and then worked together with Victoria to create a piece about change, essentially, the importance of change. So this is just a little fragment of that documentation of that installation, Blue Morph. And if we're ready, we'll go ahead and roll that for you on the big screen. Again, just a tiny fragment of that blue morph experience. Imagine, you know, being enveloped in that, uh, in an environment. By the way, you can easily find the whole video online, along with lots of other work by Jim and Victoria Vesta. So there's music for us, rhythm, music. It appears that music can be found at every level, maybe even at the most basic level of the universe, the, the smallest scale yeah, we can find? Yeah. String theory, the idea that even is just a motion, and even quantum mechanics is uh, dealt with like a wave property. You know, Schrodinger's equation to solve quantum mechanics is based on like mu basically musical instruments, how they behave. It's fascinating. And I think uh, maybe as we become less materialistic as time goes on, you know, the, that kind of musical wave-like nature will become more part of us, a harmony, if you like, of nature. And so you're working at the very tiniest of scales, or nearly so. Uh, about a year ago, I had the chance to interview the Kronos Quartet uh, before they did a performance of Terry Riley's Sun Rings, mm -hmm. Music of the Spheres, which was based on finding the same kinds of rhythm, music, if you will, at the largest scale, the yeah. largest scales that yeah. we see in, in the universe. Yeah, this, uh, you know, there's this phenomena, self-similarity. Um, mm. If you look at the universe and you look at uh, the human brain, it, it looks somewhat similar, you know, the, the structure. And so even although you go on different scales, you find this self-similarity. And I think that's something that fascinates you know, many scientists today it even goes down to, you know, social networks of people and so on, like Facebook and so on. Even is a, is a network of interconnections, essentially. Kind of suggests sort of a fractal nature to the universe, doesn't it? The at, fractal at nature scale. comes as a result of that yeah. behavior, yeah. yeah. 
Dan, you're nodding your head. You're yeah. a guy who deals with uh, those. Fractals uh, all the time. Yep. Yeah, the music <laughs> of the spheres a little bit. Yeah, you see this stuff. Well, I see it. I see it in the uh, in the fragments from uh, from the disruption of asteroids. So you break things in nature, and it it, it breaks into these sort of beautiful fractal, uh, mm. self-similar sort of structures all the time. It happens all the time. Crystal, I'll come back to you. I, you know, I'm reminded again that you study the inner workings of of brains, and and I wonder if you've thought about the the, the sort of parallel paths that science and art can take in those what is it, about 100 billion neurons that we carry here above our necks? Uh, or is it really a parallel path? Is it all really just one road? Well, it's all connected. I was actually having a conversation this morning and talking about like, oh, I had this meeting with all these artists and they were talking about all these vibration, like crazy hippie things. And this was, a, this was a engineer that was ex you know explaining this to me. And I was like, I think that we're really sort of describing the same processes. We just use different vocabularies to do it. And when we're just talking about fractals, I was thinking in my head, like, the patterns, the patterns. We can't escape the patterns, which we can't. You know, they, they drive our creative process. We drive the way that we ask questions about the world. And art and science are doing really the same thing. They're trying to explore the space that is our experience and communicate it. And anybody else from this point on, guys, if you want to jump in, feel free, uh, because we will be covering things that I'm sure the other three of you, all four of you, will, uh, will have something to add to. So uh, uh, I'll try and catch that, but don't be, don't be afraid to interrupt either. Uh, before we do that, though, Crystal, I know you also brought along a video. And it, it, it's another great example, I think, of art and science coming together that, that you and a collaborator created. Can you set up this little clip for us? Um, yeah, so um, after I defended my PhD, I moved into a career in science communication, and I was thinking about my thesis presentation and how boring a lot of those scientific talks can be, and I wasn't going into academia, and I wanted to do something different. I wanted to use my artistic creativity um, to communicate my science, and so I worked with um, a collaborator who actually was getting also her PhD in planetary science, um, not in art. Um, and we, we worked on making my introductory slides to my thesis presentation into sort of an animated explanation of the work that I do. And I think that's what some of the clips that you have here. And, and again, this is just a couple of little fragments from this, what, what became a part of uh, her thesis. Uh, and it worked. You got the PhD. Let's take a look. <laughs> The brain is a complex organ made up of billions of cells called neurons that are wired together in an integrated network of circuits and chemical communication. This communication, among other functions, is the basis of our cognitive abilities, including processes like attention, learning and memory, language, problem solving, and decision making. Neurons manipulate chemicals and electricity to pass signals to each other through their connective gaps. We study where these receptors are and how they interact with nicotine so that one day our understanding will lead to cures for diseases. But most importantly, the interaction between nicotine and nicotinic acetylcholine receptors forms the molecular basis for nicotine addiction. Smoking has been a leading cause of preventable death for the last several decades. And despite our ever-growing knowledge, a reliable smoking cessation agent has yet to be developed. Obviously, we still have many unanswered questions, and there's a whole field of scientists looking for answers. Nice, huh? I love that little video. Please, deserves that. And, and I, remind me, is that available online? Is it, it is on available YouTube? online, yeah, on um, my friend Meg's uh, YouTube channel, True Anomalies. Meg Rosenberg, Meg right? Rosenberg, yeah. And she is now, she, she got that PhD? She is now Dr. Meg Rosenberg, yeah. She, uh, she had uh, get her PhD in impact cratering on the moon um, from Caltech, and she also studied the history of science while she was getting her PhD, and uh, also does animation actually for JPL. She has a couple of other videos that she's done describing some of JPL's missions, like OCO2 and stuff like that. Dan and Chuck, just shots in the dark. Do, do you happen to know anything? Do you, have you met her or know of her? No, but I used to work in the shockwave lab doing you know, cratering experiments. Small world. <laughs> Dan, no? No, no, you'll, I wish. You'll, you'll have to look her up <laughs> <laughs> next time you're in town. Uh, Crystal, you've managed to share the arts with many of your Caltech colleagues as well in, in, in other interesting ways, including putting them on stage. 
We've got a shot here from a production of A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, uh, which you choreographed, right? I did. The, one of the most rewarding sort of um, arts experiences that I've had since I came to graduate school and became a part of the Caltech community was I was the official choreographer for the Caltech musicals. And yes, Caltech has a theater department <laughs> of one person, and we put on productions. And my favorite thing is having scientists and engineers that work at JPL and are you know in the community get this idea that they want to try something different. They want to try expressing themselves. They want to try using different mediums to, to, ex to explore their world. And they decide to audition for a theater production at Caltech. And they're scared, and they're nervous, and they don't know what to expect. And there's this great fear of the unknown. And so to be able to take people that really have no expectations for themselves and show them what they're capable of. I mean, look, these are, they're all on the same foot. Their <laughs> leg is going the same direction. <laughs> and they are facing the same way. <laughs> that is harder than it looks, people. I'll say. I've tried it. <laughs> and helping them find joy in, in that new artistic expression really makes me feel good. Of course, I think you should have called it a funny thing happened on the way to the Athenaeum, but that's kind of an inside <laughs> Caltech joke. You got that. another one here from Little Shop of Horrors. Oh, yeah. Little Shop of Horrors is one of my favorite productions because, you know, when, when you start a musical, you, you get all the music, you get the script, and in this case, you get instructions on how to build a giant man-eating plant. Um, and when you give that to production team, you know, they go and they start working on uh, building all of these things. But when your production team is a bunch of you know, engineers from JPL, they look at these plans that have been written for this giant man-eating plant, and they say, yeah, it's cute. But I have a couple of friends that just worked on Curiosity, so we're going to talk to them. <laughs> and we're going to do better. And so we had, some, we had an amazingly fun time making giant man-eating plants that actually worked and, and really getting involved. So <laughs> did you have, like, spare Mars rover parts inside your man-eating plant? <laughs> no, but actually some of the timber that was used to build our set was from the movie The Hurt Locker. Oh, so no we did manage to sort of reuse spare parts, but not from JPL. I think they're pretty careful about those. You started to talk about this earlier, but I think it's another demonstration, seeing these people on stage, that there are some pretty deep flaws in the popular notion of what scientists and engineers are really like. Yeah, that we're one-dimensional, bookish, that everything has to be logical. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of really strong ideas of what it means to be a scientist or engineer and who you have to be in order to be a scientist and an engineer. And I think that those ideas are changing, but not fast enough. And the hard thing is, especially when I'm working with uh, you know, the people from the Caltech community to put on productions like this, is the way that they project that image onto themselves. Well, I'm not good at this. I'm an engineer. I, have, I think like this. Um, and that, that really hurts them. And I love getting them to open up and to realize that maybe their self-image is something that they can change. And I think that, at least for me personally, having that creative side and knowing that that was a part of me very early, because I was, I was dancing for my entire life, maybe helped me with my science. You know, Out of the box thinking is you know, this sort of thing that we all hear about, but we're not really sure what it means. And, yeah. and being able to to be creative with the way that you use your tools is something that artists do and that scientists could learn to do better. I know it, uh, so many creative people at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and, and they, a lot of them hide it. In fact, yeah. I did. And, and I, I, I didn't tell people, I didn't even tell my boss that I was playing gigs at night and uh, traveling around. I take vacation, but I'd be actually going to China doing a jazz festival. You know, <laughs> and so. Uh, it, 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 I even got my CD. I gave it to my boss. He still, it's still in the wrapper, and because oh. he wants to keep it pristine. Oh, and oh. Uh, collector's item. <laughs> you know, and uh, so there's a. I think people have. You're right. I think that I think that engineers and scientists like to like keep their things separate mm. a little bit, and some. But I, the ones I that are just allow that piece of them to come out is uh, are the people that I connect with most at JPL and Caltech and um, uh, but for a long time I just didn't tell anybody because I I thought maybe I'd be like oh, okay well he's he's not going to show up tomorrow morning you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, but I've been there three over 30 years and uh, I've uh, started playing at JPL occasionally and uh, letting people know I'm a musician and and uh, but it's 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 weird it is it's two different worlds uh, um, and they're not mutually exclusive uh, 
I, whenever I go to a gig or something, some, some jazz musician says, okay, tell me, tell me what's going on with string theory these days. You know, or, cool. or they're, they're, people are just so into it, you know, in, in the music world, in, in the jazz world especially. And it's in the, uh, uh, the, the difficult thing for me is to turn off that thing I have at work, you know, mm -hmm. and just let it go and just be in the, that moment and just, just feel every, every minute, every second when you're playing and just being in that space. It's, it's, it's transition is difficult, but I've practiced a long time, but you know, it's, it's not something you get right away, especially if you're, you're analytical a little bit, you know? You can kind of, you know, look at yourself and go, oh, I didn't do that right. Or, but, but without always maybe having to turn it off, do you see some of your playing in some way reflecting back or benefiting what you do in the lab? Um, I think it, it does because I, I don't get stuck in a mindset. I can, I can drop something and, 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 and say, and basically improvise and say, mm -hmm. okay, well, that's not working. We can just like change that, just drop that. Bad riff. <laughs> yeah, bad. It's that that's not going anywhere. It's not. There's no second ending. No, <laughs> no, no coda. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's the kind of. Inf uh, plus, the, there's also such a, a beautiful visual thing at JPL. Every picture is amazing. You know, the pictures of the micro devices we build are just gorgeous. You know, there's a lot of order and and there's. There's a lot of just beautiful stuff hmm. visually. So as a visual artist, I think I'd even be more inclined to say that's a real connection there. Yeah. Not still with music, but uh, certainly in the, in the, the process of, of thinking, about, uh, um, uh, thinking about how you do your work and how, what you're gonna do next. We were uh, back in 1998, uh, we were working on the Mars Sample Return Project. And and we thought we could bring samples back from Mars. Well, turns out we just didn't know enough about uh, extremophile uh, organisms uh, that can survive in crazy places like clean rooms that are sterile. You got bacteria that grows uh, completely um, and a native to and and have tr transmuted themselves into a, an organism that can survive with that kind of environment. Life finds and, a way. And for life finds a way. So we had to go. Okay. We're going to have to build something that uh, uh, a, a, a a such a sterile facility uh, to handle the samples, and also worrying about you know bring, bringing possible life forms back to Earth. That kind of planetary protection requirements were so tough that we ended up um, saying you know we can't do this right now. Hmm. We, just, we have to like, bag it. You know this is not going to work, and uh, that's an example of just dealing with facts and just saying okay. Leave it alone. Yeah. You don't get too caught up on ideas. Another day will come. Yes. Jim, you must run into this perhaps mm -hmm. artificial firewall that mm -hmm. some people want to see between oh, yeah. art and science. <clears throat> yeah. Well, actually, when I worked in IBM, I am, it was like, uh, like I started uh, 35 years ago. It was very much, uh, you know, uh, scientists work, want to work on closed systems, you know, like a closed test tube. They want to be objective. You know, they don't want to be connected to the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's changed as I started to work in art and science, also in my science, because the science I do at the moment is trying to build a brain. That's one of the things we work on. And in that work, uh, you can't have a closed system. It, it, w it won't function in a closed system. In fact, most of the laws of uh, physics and chemistry around us don't actually work outside a laboratory. And the, and the whole concept of being um, objective and far away from it is also, you know, in terms of quantum mechanics, impossible. Hmm. Yeah. So, so for me, it was, you know, I was looking at a single atom. And one day I realized, you know, well, first I got bored. You know, <laughs> took, took all this time to look at the atom and move it or something. And then I realized, uh, well, actually, it's not a single atom. Because, you know, this whole microscope, its tip, it was, you know, above the atom, the atom was on a surface. It's all part of one thing. And theoretically, if you look at it, it's one thing. So everything is connected. And uh, when you think about that, then it's natural to me that art and science become more connected. 
you know, this artificial distinction that arose from the, from the, you know, the industrial revolution, and you know, people have to be put into certain jobs, yeah. is, is disappearing. It's much more to do with creativity, just like culture and technology are merged today. It's been mentioned, you know. Yeah. It's um, like an Apple. I don't want to advertise it, but you know, like Apple computers, they have beautiful design. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, you know, the PCs, they look ugly. Less so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dan, I want to get your thought about this as well, but Crystal, were you going to jump in? Yeah, I just, I wanted to say something more about this idea that artists are these like deeply emotional, passionate people, that scientists are these very cerebral, disassociated sort of individuals. Like, that is absolutely not true. Like, that idea is complete nonsense. Have you ever asked a scientist to explain their work to you? They, the, they light up, they, you, they start using gestures, they get really, we we are deeply and passionately. Look at Dan's face right now. You'll get an example. Deeply and yep. passionately involved in the questions that we ask about the universe and why we think those are the interesting questions to ask. And we're creative about the way that we go about discovering the answers to those questions. So I, I would really like people to stop thinking that there is that break between the artist personality and the scientific yeah. personality because it's not a thing, guys. It's not a thing. <laughs> Dan. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And I, I just I wanted to step in there because science itself, I mean, that I mean, OK, so the, the tools of science and the process by which we go through that might be that sort of, you know, that that analytic way of, of doing things that, that that's that's well and true. But um, but the, but the process, the, the doing the creative, you know, the sparks of insight. That's that's every bit as creative a, a thing as, as anything in art. You know, that's 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 why this Again, this distinction I think is is rather artificial. I mean, yeah, I mean, granted, the the you know the, the tools of the two might be a little bit different, but um, but you know, hey, we're human beings, right? And uh, we we're, we're allowed to do you know more than one thing simultaneously. So, as long as we're talking to you, Dan, you've got some more of your work that we want to show off, uh, beginning yeah. with this literally otherworldly <laughs> painting. Uh, those aren't from our neighborhood, are they? Uh, no, um, the, I don't know if you have the title on there or not, but uh, I titled this the, uh, the, the HD 99109B system. Uh, kind of an of odd course. title for a piece of artwork. It's but so of course, romantic, I know. Yeah, you know. I, some of my titles are a little bit more romantic. This one I was actually feeling rather like, you know, I want to do something a little bit more, you know, a little bit more literal. And uh, this is a real system, a real exoplanet system that we really know about. This, uh, it's, a, it's an actual star system uh, off in the constellation Leo, 160 light years away. It's a... Um, you know, a little bit, little bit cooler, more orange star than our sun, but it's known to have an exoplanet. And it's known to have a planet about half the mass of Jupiter out there at about one, one AU, about the same distance from that star as the Earth is. And that's, a, you know, been a fascination of mine for, like I said, for so long that um, I just feel compelled to put these worlds out there every now and then. This is, you know, the, 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 the initial, you know, before this, you know, onslaught of, of planetary discoveries that we've had, we kind of had this, the sense, you know, from our example of one, our own planetary system, we kind of thought, well, maybe we're kind of typical, right? And so, when a lot of these systems started showing up with these, with these, you know, Jupiter-like planets or Jupiter-mass planets in so close to the star, um, kind of upset the apple cart a little bit. Yeah. And um, I think a lot of people initially started thinking, oh gosh, well, okay, well, no life there. Um, you know, they're hot Jupiters, right? And you know, they're they're, you know, but I've always had this fascination. I, Partially, I think, because of the artist in me, it makes for better, better landscapes to put a big planet in the sky. But, but I think it's, it's actually kind of, kind of interestingly true that you know, a lot of these planets probably have moons around them. And if you've got, you know, OK, maybe the planet might not have a solid surface, and it maybe is too warm to be habitable in there at 1 AU or, or even closer. You know, some of these might have moons. Pandora, that, right? Like, With apologies Pandora, to yeah, Jim I mean, Cameron. Yeah, um, you know, I, 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 I have to come back to Avatar. We'll, we'll talk about that a couple times, I'm sure, yeah. through this. Um, but but it, I, I was just primed to love that movie right from the beginning because I was already thinking of these kinds of things. And it was, you know, for me, that movie was like, oh, my God, this is exactly what I've wanted to do for so long, this sort of photo real you know, realistic, some thoughtful, you know, input into what, what a system like this might be. So I was just, I was just primed to be blown away by that movie. And we've got more of your images in just a moment, but before we do that, it, am I crazy or does it seem like a disproportionate number of you planetary scientists who hang out in the southwestern United States 
uh, seem to be artists. I mean, yeah. am I right? Well, yeah, I don't know if it's disproportionate. I guess um, I, I guess I have a little bit of a local bias only because that's where I, I know a lot of folks. Right here in our own department at Southwest Research where I work, uh, we've got at least three or four uh, scientists who are, who are artists. We've got, a, in fact, the former president of the International Association of Astronomical Artists is two offices down from me, and he's a, he's a binary star PhD. He does light curves of binary stars. And, um, of course, you know, uh, outside of our institute, but also in the Southwest, you've got uh, probably my, you know, the, the, the person who, one of the people who actually got me into, you know, thinking I could, I could do this kind of artwork is, uh, is Bill Hartman from the Planetary Science Institute. He's Great sort guy. of that quintessential renaissance man, you know, planetary scientist, artist, um, very good at, at using the art to convey the science and drawing inspiration from the artwork and the visual world to help inform actually some of the models that are that are described at, at, at the science meetings. I think it's refreshing to actually have the inspiration sometimes come from this very, you know, visual exploration of the world that comes from the artwork. Yeah. Let's go to another one of those images. This first one, though, very much an earthbound image, nothing uh, too out of the ordinary here. We're going to jump to it. There we go. Beautiful beach scene. Yet, you applied your imagination and skills and turned it into what, what I think is an even more beautiful, though entirely alien vista, or, or maybe not entirely alien, which gets into how you created this. Let's see that transition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pretty cool, huh? I knew we'd get some oohs and ahs. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a gallery of these on my website, actually. We kind of see it. So I, I kind of, I, I like, I, this is actually something I learned from some of my matte painting friends. They often on their websites, they'll put these sort of before and after their, their initial plate, the photographic element that they were inspired by or, or incorporated into the artwork, and, and then overlaying the final piece onto that. It's, it's, it's actually kind of fun to see that transformation sometimes. But um, there's, a, there's a bit of an otherworldly connection even to the, to the worldly terrestrial scene there. That's actually the, uh, uh, Cocoa Beach. That's the, the beach just, uh, just south of Kennedy Space Center. Hmm. Um, and I, uh, I took that photo uh, the morning after one of my zero-G flights actually out there, uh, some of the training that we're doing for something we'll talk about a little bit later maybe. Uh, we don't have many beaches here in Colorado, so I was I was cheating and gathering some reference imagery. And uh, literally, it was months later when I got back home and was just zipping through my images again. I, I just kept staring at these beach images, and uh, that's that's kind of what was in my head was you know what if, what if what if Cocoa Beach was just a little bit different and uh, a little bit more otherworldly. This could be a scene on one of the moons of that planet we saw just a moment ago that just occurred to me. Uh, you've also created a pretty fanciful image of a ship that is designed to take us to places like this. There it is. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, if you're going to go and explore exoplanets, you've got to have a way to get there. Uh, this, for me, was the joy of going digital. I, I started out art, my, my art life, um, you know, traditionally painting, slopping acrylic pigments on canvas and illustration board and things like that. And I still, um, I, I kind of miss it in some ways. I haven't done a traditional painting in, in, in several years now. Um, every time I go out with my fellow space artists and we're out in the field and I see them you know, plain air painting. Uh, I just, I, I feel that urge, that draw to get back into it. Uh, but this, this was, this was partially the reason I went digital is to be able to do stuff like this. Actually, you know, generating, uh, you know, realistic geometry and, and proper rendering and mm -hmm. proper lighting. It was, uh, you know, quite admittedly a, li a little bit beyond my artistic abilities in a, from a traditional sense. But when you can go out there and actually, you know, polygon by polygon, element by element, build these things up digitally. Um, and then, you know, in a photo real way, render them. It just gives me personally the opportunity to go and, you know, explore in, in, in ways that I, that I couldn't do traditionally. So it's good to me. It looks it. like it ought to be in the, you know, that uh, first of those avatar sequels, I think. <laughs> uh, Crystal, you were going to jump in? Yeah, I love that you said that this was sort of an example of like, you decided to go digital because we have on this panel a bunch of scientifically trained people that also do art. But I think, you know, we use art to have let our imagination free and and that's a medium of expression for our imagination is what we're seeing with this beautiful work but you have a lot of artists that are looking to science and technology as a way of actualizing what, what they are imagining in their head mm. the the mediums for what they want to say don't exist and so they're going to scientists they're going to technologists that are they're making new things yeah exactly way to do that. exactly it's and the another other way around was scientific visualization, making data much more real and palpable than it was years ago by making it visual. They are tools that we have available to us that we didn't have before. We have this debate a lot amongst our, you know, the space artists, you know, digital versus, 
traditional, right? It's, it's almost like you have to shake my finger at them. If you're making the same problem you do when you do art versus science, there shouldn't be any verses. They're just tools, right? They're, they're, they're additional ways for us to express ourselves and, and get these, these, these visions in our head or, 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 or sounds and songs in our head and so on out there. And the tool shouldn't matter. The medium shouldn't matter. It's, the, it's, the, um, it's, it's what you do with it and how you express and how you... How you have fun with it, basically. For me, very, that's what it's all about. Very quickly, you've got a little bit of a video that we want to show before we move on. And uh, because it was another push out into uh, another side of the medium, I guess. Yeah, and it, yeah. it's kind of a home movie. Let's uh, take a look at that. Literally a home movie. Um, <laughs> it starts out uh, with a scene some of you may have actually seen. This is actually, not, I have to tell you, not too far from Hilo on the big island of Hawaii. but. Um, never, I had a, to, never had a sky like that above here. Yeah, I decided to go a little different with that sky. And this, again, this was just an experiment for me to, you know, to go beyond the still imagery that I do with my digital art and try experimenting a little bit with some of the, uh, you know, th there's an intersection. These tools that I use to do this digital art um, have a lot of intersection. In fact, some of them are the very same tools that are used in the visual effects industry. Mm -hmm. And so in the process of, of taking online courses, um, in some cases from, from some of the actual people who have won the Oscars and the Emmys for their visual effects, uh, I've, I've started kind of wanting to, you know, it's, it's kind of like, well, what can I do with that? And so you start playing around with this, this yeah. kind of stuff. But, you know, let me, let me, let me, let me come back to this, this piece that we just saw there with the tracking, that, that, that the commercial software, the tracking technology that uh, is required to go in there and, and analyze almost, almost in real time the, the, the perspective of the camera and where it's aiming and so on. Um, uh, it's used in artwork, it's used for this visual effects stuff, obviously. But in the process, I found, in fact, that it actually has ended up being useful for my research as well. That very mm -hmm. same software um, I've actually used to employ tracking the features on some of the, the rock specimens I use in my, in my impact experiments. Yeah, so there's a so, nice uh, expression of the synergy, if you'll yeah. pardon the expression, to be found here. Yeah, they Chuck. cross over. There's that comment I made about Leonardo da Vinci. So I want to return to the, the nanoscale here and, and look at something that, that you created, uh, which uh, will pop up there, because it's pretty significant. It may look familiar at first, but tell us what we're looking at here. Well, um, uh, before Mars Curiosity was uh, launched, uh, Charles Alacci, the, the director of JPL, uh, was visiting uh, Italy, uh, the museum of the Royal Museum of Turin, and and uh, some of the people over there asked him, if is it possible to to send uh, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, Codex of Bird Flight to Mars? And he said, Well, by the way, we are collecting people's signatures, and we're going to write them with electron beam lithography uh, capability onto a little chip. Not, not zeros and ones, actual mm. image. Actual image and people's signatures. And, and so I took the, they, so they, they sent me the, uh, the, the JPEG images of his work, which is high resolution. It was really cool to look at and uh, up close. And I did a lot of uh, photo retouching on it and got rid of all the, the, the parchment color and just highlighted the ink and uh, went in there and fixed everything so I could, so you can actually have a either black or white uh, image of each page and uh, we shrunk them down and that little black line that you see on the on the right there it's uh, it sets a hundred microns that's about the, the typical thickness of a human hair there's an even better uh, illustration of the scale of this on the next image so we'll jump over to that yeah. So there's the, the human hair yeah. up there on the right. And so what's really cool is that there's this, every single pen stroke from da Vinci's work is sitting on a chip, barely small, big enough to see with your eye, because that's one of the bigger images we put on there. But it, uh, it's sitting there in the sun on Mars right now. Hmm. And it's going to be there for, you know, who long, a billion years? How long does it take for the... I put a piece of glass on top of it so the, the Martian wind doesn't erode it. So Pretty cool. Jim, is there any question in your mind that what Chuck was doing here is art? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I would ask the artist. Wow. <laughs> we, we'll get a microphone over but, to her in a minute. Maybe we'll save that question for you, Victoria, when, we, when like we get out nice there a moment or two uh, from now. Well, it certainly, uh, it certainly is uh, uh, 
sharing uh, kind of in a time capsule this wonderful work that da Vinci did on studying uh, uh, how birds fly and then he dissected all these bird wings and looked at how they do and tried to actually build a mechanical plane yeah. in this book and it, it included airbags with it person to pull uh, airbags to, if you land you won't hurt yourself so this is it's sort of uh, the, the same idea for the, your Mars brother Catholic. Rob stole this from Leonardo yes, he da Vinci did. He did. his brother is Rob Manning who is probably the world's foremost expert on getting things down in one piece to the surface of Mars yes he's a chief engineer engineer of the Mars program and uh, he developed Pathfinder MER and because uh, uh, curiosity, yeah. and landing systems and things like that. I want to go by very quickly here another image uh, that is, is something that Chuck has worked on. Uh, this little so-called Spider One Plus D. But well, what, this what? is this is a, a bolometer. It's a temperature sensor, and the the uh, what you have there is a. It, it, this is not small, by the way. This is big. You can see what we do. This is, this <laughs> Even though it's sitting on a dime. Yeah, when it's sitting on a dime, yeah, that's right. That's, that's huge, right? Um, it's, it's <laughs> this is, you don't work with stuff this no, gigantic, no, no, do no, you, Jim? No, this, no. Is, this is so it's, way this beyond is that. Re relatively easy to make. What, it's, it's hard to design. What it is, is it, it, the, uh, there's a, a micro mesh of silicon nitride that's holding this little sensor in the middle, and that, that couples with certain uh, 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 radiation from, in this case, we're looking at cosmic migrate background. And, um, and put an array of these. We have these on Herschel spacecraft, uh, with the European Space Agency, and we have a, a, it's an array of them, not just one. So, yeah. And they have many other different types of technologies. Uh, also on um, one of those spacecraft, looking at interesting stuff right now. Well, yeah, because this is art expressed, or at least an aesthetic expressed through science and function at a tiny scale, and yet it's being used to reconstruct the structure of the entire universe. And what's interesting too is like if you, get, if you go back far enough to the beginning of the Big Bang, the universe was this big. So we're, it's been magnified that over, the, over the 13 billion years, right? So it's, uh, uh, we're actually using small things to look at big thing that used to be a small thing, <laughs> right? Cycles. Yes. There, there's just one more that I, I want to bring up here, and we can go ahead and uh, put it up there, Dave, uh, because I'm not sure it's art, but I think it is an expression of how purely functional design can achieve a certain aesthetic quality of its own. This device, Chuck, is, is actually in the process of making scientific history this year as yeah, we speak. Um, the guys in my lab and uh, work with uh, Jamie Bach. He's a professor at Caltech. and. Uh, and he and, uh, uh, helped design these, these detectors. Uh, this is a trans e transition edge sensor and uh, uh, other components on there, superconducting components, um, uh, that it were, they're cooled and to, to make measurements of the cosmic microwave background. And it was sitting in a, they put it in a telescope for many years down in uh, um, the Antarctic. In the South Pole, basically. South Pole, right, right in the middle of the South Pole. And, uh, lo and looked at the polarity of the cosmic microwave background, which might show gravitational waves. And that's the gravitational waves that were created at the Big Bang and uh, uh, one trillionth, one trillionth, one trillionth of a second. And uh, so that's, it's, it's amazing to see something in a laboratory building, and then it's going out looking something, looking at uh, uh, data from yeah. that's, that's so ancient, so, primordial to the organization of this universe is so perfectly, you know, uh, um, such a high energy state. So and we're all kind of uh, uh, beneficiaries of that. That's why we are here. Cause yeah, we're, it is exactly why we're here. I don't know about you guys, but it makes me very proud to think that our species is capable of creating instruments like this that can detect things from the first tiny instant of the existence of this universe. It's pretty cool. But really why I wanted to include this is that sort of form following function and the beauty that can be found in these kinds of forms. Jim, I, mean, I also think of, you know, there are certain things that, that I just love to look at. DC-3s, that old mm -hmm. airplane that was developed in the 1930s, 
is to me a thing of beauty. It wasn't designed for that. There is a bridge down towards San Diego on Interstate 15, which is just a joy to see. Your research touches on this kind of stuff, doesn't it? Yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> the actual machines we use are beautiful to me. And we, we build them, you know. But the actual, then we look at basically landscapes, you know, atomic landscapes. And uh, especially at the beginning, it's very, very exciting to see, you know, it's like an exploration of land that's never been seen before. So, you know, those, um, those images that we made, they're actually, you know, top, they're not actually pictures, but they're, imagine if you feel the surface and reconstruct an image back from them. Um, they're really, really fascinating. And uh, yeah, they actually inspire a kind of, you know, artistic element mm -hmm. in me as well. And something that actually I like to share with, I started to share with artists when I moved to UCLA, and um, just to find how much they actually, you know, are inspired by these things. But as time goes on, all the static image is not so inspiring to me anymore. It's more the dynamics, hmm. how things change, you know? So even a, a landscape changes, like the desert, you know, you, the wind blows, there are wave patterns that changes. And so those changes are, are fascinating. The images are more the result of changes. So, you know, a painting is a result of somebody painting. But almost everything we, we, we have in life is, is, is changing, for the worse or the better, or, or both, up and down. So well, as you said, if no movement is death. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And associated with movement, there is uh, what's called chaos, or apparent chaos. It's not really chaos. And then there's you know order. Uh, but in between order and chaos is the most uh, important you know, hmm. area to be in, at least for you. That's where I like to live. For your, yeah, for the, for the human being, for all life, for nature. It's, and, and down to the atomic scale, it's a state between order and chaos. Speaking of the dynamic, you've got a couple of other video mm -hmm. clips that we want to show off sure. here. Uh, beginning with one called Nano Mandala, and yeah. just, this is just, a, again, a short segment from this. But if you would set it up for us. Sure. So uh, together with Victoria Vesna, um, we were asked to, uh, or she was asked initially, and she wrote me in to do a, a, an exhibition in, um, it was in LACMA. It ran two years. It was called Nano. It was a very big exhibit. Um, and in the process, we, in the process, we were, um, we were actually uh, asked if we could, could we pick a patent from LACMA to put in this uh, gallery? And we picked actually a mandala. We wanted a mandala. And uh, they didn't like this idea because, you know, take out, you know, nanotech and this ancient mandala, they don't go together. And then, uh, just as it happens, we met these Tibetan monks. And I can't go into the story because it's too complicated, mm -hmm. but it's like they appeared. <laughs> and, uh, and they were building, a, I think it's the biggest uh, mandala at LACMA uh, over a period of months uh, that's been shown in, you know, in the West. And so we became friends with, the, with these monks. And the monks uh, wanted to visit the lab. And uh, you know, I showed them the equipment and, they, and I said, this is vacuum to create nothing. And he says, all this for nothing. <laughs> and I said, we look at atoms, and they said, well, we have a meditation to count the atoms on the wall. And I was like, ah. <laughs> but I said, the microscope doesn't work at the moment. It hadn't worked for two or three months. Anyway, weird thing, they laughed, and it worked. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, the, we said, Could we, we'd like to do this you know, powers of 10 type thing of the mandala. Ah, we'll come back to the powers yeah. of 10. Yeah. Okay, and uh, we started to work with them. Yeah. So uh, let's take a look at this very uh, brief excerpt. If 
And I wanted to make sure that it ran through that uh, kaleidoscopic effect at the end because it makes me think of X-ray crystallography and, mm -hmm. and looking at the structure of a molecule. Oh, yeah. I never thought of that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it really is beautiful and, and yeah. transcendent. And as so much of your and Victoria's work seems to be, but what also electrified me was the sense that it must have been, in part, a tribute to that film that you mentioned, The Powers of Ten, created by the fabulous Charles and Ray Eames back in the mm -hmm. late 1960s, early 70s. Am I right? Yeah, and except that it probably um, goes beyond The Power of Ten in the sense you get to the point where it's invisible, you know? Mm. It, it kind of is, it, it's, I don't know, it's, very, inspired, pretty, by, it's very inspired by Powers of Ten, but it's, um, it's, it has a different feeling. So, you know, the people that actually see this thing, um, they can touch the sand, you know, mm. and, and manipulate it. It's very interactive. Yeah, there and, is a scene of kids playing in the sand. Yeah, and so, yeah, and so we, we're not trying to make it so literal in a way. It's more, uh, it's more like in, in terms of the imagination, you know, more ephemeral yeah. in its nature. Um, and it also had some, you know, we, we had to do the center part in, in the laboratory. And the monks came to do the center part. And so at the end, they, uh, they go through this process where they destroy the mandala. And uh, it's very violent. They smash it to pieces. They took it down to Santa Monica Pier and <laughs> threw it in there. And we had this... Uh, a small piece, the center in the laboratory that they had made. And so we wanted to move it, and they said, no, you can't move it. Once it's there, it has to stay there. And we had to move all the microscopes <laughs> around it. And we couldn't move it for months. I don't know, it was sure, I think it was many months this mandala was up. And so when it came to destroy that mandala, the big one, then we actually could hmm. take apart the small one. So it, it, it's, it's, it's not just, you know, okay, we do this scientific imagery and all this stuff and make a piece out. It has a, something, you know, uh, something that can be expressed analytically in yeah. words, you know. We've almost reached the point uh, in this afternoon when we will look to those of you who are here with us in the Crawford Family Forum who have your questions that you might have for our very distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, that's coming up in just a couple of moments here. I do want to ask, how many of you have seen Powers of Ten? Okay, those of you who have not seen it, leave right now. <laughs> Go to your local computing device and look it up. It, it's linked to from the Wikipedia. I uh, just put Powers of Ten into the Wikipedia. Take a look at it. I think it is still probably the best short science teaching tool, certainly for the, to demonstrate the scale of the universe that I have ever seen uh, in, in the entire history of film and video. It really is pretty cool. And to think that it came from these two people, man and wife, who also designed exquisite furniture is, uh, is pretty amazing stuff. Uh, just one more short video, and then we will get to your questions, as I said. And uh, this one, Jim, has a, uh, lots of interactive elements, like a lot of the work that you do with uh, Victoria. I want to let's go ahead and show that a uh, little bit of this uh, illustration from this work called Zero at Wave Function.
that's another one where I wish I had been one of those kids pushing the balls mm -hmm. around. When was that? How long ago? That, that, that was the first piece we ever did together. She did her PhD in art mm. on uh, Buckminster Fuller, maybe people know of. And uh, I actually did experiments with a molecule, 60 carbon atoms. It looks like this soccer ball. Buckyball. Buckyball. And so I made an abacus from it, you know, once uh, they got a lot of attention. And together we decided to do this piece. And the idea was basically to, instead of this microscope, you know, that would poke the molecules, okay, we were actually using the shadow of a person's hand as a kind of metaphor. I know that in art, see, scientists don't like the word metaphor, but artists love metaphor. But the, as a metaphor, and you could change then the molecule, and it bends in a kind of, I'd say, non-Newtonian, non-expected kind of way. Hmm. And that was to show that the physics at the quantum scale was diff diff different. But it was immensely, it's immensely popular, you know, in terms of at LACMA, young kids loved it. Um, at the end, there were a pair of lovers, uh, you know, that were, one had one hand and the other hand, and they were pushing the buckyball together. And old people, you know, were, everyone loved this piece. And it also shimmers. There's a little shakiness in it to represent the fact that in this room, we all kind of vibrate due mm. to the thermal energy, you know? So it was a real fun piece to do. Can we, uh, with that microphone that's going to go to the audience, I don't know uh, who out there has it right now, but if we can go over here to Victoria, way up in the front. Uh, Victoria Vesna, who, as you've heard, is uh, Jim, Jim Zevsky's uh, collaborator. Victoria, welcome, first of all. Thank you. Thank you for having me. When, when we look at a piece like that that is so interactive, do you see people interacting with it in ways that end up being completely unexpected? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things we wanted to show is uh, that you can uh, affect change from a distance. And it's a very strange feeling to have your shadow actually make the change happen. Spooky action at a distance, as Albert Einstein called it. Yes, very much. But what we really made a point of when we were designing the buckyball, uh, first we, he was, uh, Jim was saying to us it's like a, a soccer ball. So we designed it with the programmer to be like a soccer ball, and he came in and said, no, it doesn't work like that at all. <laughs> it doesn't function like that. You have the, the stronger the move is, the less you affect the change. So you have to actually move slow mm. to make change happen. And that became beautiful to watch the audience almost move slow motion to make the buckyball change. Fascinating. We're going to go to questions now, unless do any of the others of you want to jump in here as we've uh, looked at Jim's work? Oh, I mean, I saw that, that piece, that we, the video that we just watched, and I was like, oh my gosh, that would be an amazing creative space to do some choreography with. Because oh, mm -hmm. like, visual, or, like people that are you know, dancers, choreographers, like, you don't have the opportunity to really show how you're affecting the negative space around you. Everyone just focuses on what the body is doing, right? But to be able to have some visualization of the, those energetic changes. Like, I had a billion ideas just from watching <laughs> yeah. that right, video. I, I'm looking for a new collaboration <laughs> yeah. here, including I, I think I think that's the thing about, you know, anything to do with art and science, and particularly this, the way we work, is uh, you have to have the human involved. So everything, the human changes the art. You know, or the human interacts with, and there's a feedback. So it's you know feed forward, feed back, and and that's what I love. And so you're welcome to come over and <laughs> yes, I will. We have that. a Leonardo uh, meeting. And it's usually on Thursdays if you go to the website, and uh, any everyone's welcome. And we have like neuroscientists talking. We have you know people that are into digital music. We have all sorts of people from every field. Holy cow, I um, want to go to this. Please, every Thursday? Uh, we would love it. Yeah, yeah, once a once month. Once a month, yeah. once a month, OK. Yeah. Is this on the website somewhere where people yes. can figure we, out how well, to we get can, to this? Yes, we can give you it. And uh, 
everyone comes and it's a fantastic yeah. experience. We Chuck, to... Crystal, we can carpool. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dan, you're going to have to fly in. I like, like that. <laughs> let's, let's turn to the audience uh, because I bet you folks want to get in on this. Again, raise your hand and somebody will come over with a microphone and do try to keep it as brief, as succinct as possible. We have a gentleman right up here in the front. Liz is bringing the mic over. Hi, sir. Hi. And tell us, what's your name? My name is Brent Watterson. I'd like to understand what you guys think about the observer relationship to the observed in the artistic creation like Rare Window, like Manet, or like putting a rover like Curiosity on Mars. How does the observer change? What's the relationship in the art world of the observer to the observed? What's the relationship of the, in the science world of the observer to the observed? That's great. Little Schrodinger's uh, cat. Uh, paradigm there. Uh, does that cat make well, it into the I world of art? I certainly feel it all the time. And when I, when I play a saxophone or per performing, what I play is really based on the vibe I'm getting from the people I'm, that's listening to me. And sometimes I, I, I get a vibe and say, well, that's enough. <laughs> 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 and I'll stop. But no, that there, there is always that feeling of like, you know, and, and the thing is to take that in and not be intimidated by it and let it f feel like that you're actually part of it, so it makes you feel like you're kind of one with this collective conscious a little bit. Dan, you may be the, the person of, these, of the four of you who may be the most removed, in a sense, from your audience, from your observer, and yet do you still feel that connection? Yeah, I do, I do. I mean, I, it's a, I do my art for myself, and I'm really pleased when other people like it, but I also try to you know, I'm, I'm out there looking at my landscapes and looking at my scene the way I'm thinking and imagining perhaps that the, uh, that the people who look at the art might um, as well. And it's, it is a little uncanny sometimes to be in there working on this piece and it gets to be so immersive. You know, I'm, I'm in that piece of work. I'm in that world, if you will, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm creating it. And that's, that's why I like doing it. It's, it's, such, a, it's such a break. I, I forgot who it was earlier who, who mentioned it was either, either Chuck or Jim mentioned about sort of, you know, you... You, you, you kind of lose yourself, you know, it's like I can, put, I can put all the technical, all the analytical away, I can put the day job away when I'm doing my artwork, and um, there's, there's, I mean, there's, there's nothing going on up here when I'm doing my artwork, right? Uh, some people say there's nothing going on up here when I do my science either, but that's a, that's a different story. Um, but it's true, I mean, it's, it's, for me, it's that real release, and so I'm, I'm there, I'm in the art, I'm in the scene, and um, I, I hope in some way the, the viewer gets to come along with that as well. But Crystal, maybe not consciously, but I'll bet there's a whole bunch going on up there. I was going to say, I don't maybe have a philosophical opinion to share with you, but I, I deal with that dynamic really frequently when I do my science communication. I try and use artistic methods, be it animation or, you know, there's this really, really great competition that you can enter called Dance My PhD, where anyone that has a PhD is, is welcome to use uh, movement arts as a way of describing the science and the observations that they made as a scientist and communicating in a different way. And I think that part of breaking out of the, the technical training that we as scientists have and really being able to effectively communicate the impact of the observations we make in the lab to other people. We're forced to deal with that dynamic and I enjoy using art as a way to kind of bridge that. But I don't know if that's mm. really a direct answer to your question. Uh, I, think, I think in terms of painting, you know, there's an exhibition at the moment, I've forgotten the name of the artist, but she is, she's very famous and it's very popular. And uh, there's the art, you can't see it, it's just, you know, it's just four walls. And, it, and, it, and, and she says, just because you can't see the art didn't mean I spent a lot of time working on it. <laughs> and so it's essentially, um, it's really packed, I think it's in London. And uh, people are queuing up to go in. And so when they go in, it's actually just the observers. The observers are observing uh, the invisible. What's that musical <laughs> composition? Was it by Satie kind of or something? Hmm? The one where you just, the orchestra comes out and the conductor is there and they begin the piece and no one does anything. You just sit that's, in silence. Uh, yeah, that's John Cage. Cage, yeah. of course. Yeah, okay, yeah. John Cage. Interesting piece. Well, look what you, the observer, generated in terms of discussion up here. Any other questions? Anybody else who'd like to get in on this discussion of science and art that we have today? Way over here on this end, Haley's working her way over to you. Hi, sir. What is your name? Michael Baquet. Haley's my daughter, uh, daughter's name. 
So uh, each of your guests is obviously accomplished in more than one arena, so I welcome input from each and every one of you. So if you are in your science and engineering domain, do you ever have an aha moment that helps you in the artistic arena and vice versa? Great question. Who wants it first? Chuck? I don't know if I have aha moments necessarily, um, but I think that, that, that the thing that, that gets close between art and, the, and doing engineering science is that uh, when you're doing art, I, we're, you do have to do it in the actual moment. You can't be, because we live our lives either thinking about what we just did or planning what we're going to do next, and so our nows are somewhere between the future and the past. And, but in, when you get that aha moment in engineering or science, you're right there in that second. And that's when it feels like art, you know? And so it's, it's more of a feeling of being really present in, in the moment you're in and, and being responsive, reflective of that rather than thinking, well, this means I have to do this and or, uh, that, that I, I should have done this or, you know, that kind of thing where you're, you're, you're in two places at once in order to hmm. survive in this world, you know? thinking about the future and the past at the same time and being somewhere in between. Dan Durda? Yeah, I, uh, I already mentioned, I think, uh, this, uh, this sort of interface sometimes between the software I use and my artwork and uh, having these, literally, these little aha moments of, hey, wait a minute, I've got this problem I need to solve in my research work that this would make it so much easier to do. And uh, because it's, I have to say, because it's commercial software, it's designed for real people to use, um, uh, Chuck, you, you know, sometimes in the science world, we deal with some pretty arcane software that people hmm. have written that it just barely cobbled together to work. Um, and it's a time. real pleasure sometimes when you get to use some commercial software that's designed to be actually elegant and useful and workful. And um, uh, I've had those aha moments in my artwork saying, I can use this in my science. And it has really ended up being, being very helpful in those cases. Crystal, in brain research, do you get those aha moments uh, that also touch on art? Yeah, I think the answer that I want to give is that we can get, we were talking about the patterns earlier, right? You can kind of get caught up in one. So we get anxious or we put pressure on ourselves to solve a problem. And especially when you're in graduate school, <laughs> um, there can be pressure from outside sources as well to solve the problem quickly. No. And <laughs> it's a totally supportive, relaxing environment. And so sort of anecdotally dealing um, with scientists and engineers that come and helping them explore the artistic space, I think that they have told me that just being able to relax one aspect of you know, their concerns for the day and really be able to focus on, on something else allows advances to be made, maybe in an unconscious way that, that they are then you know, able to capitalize on later. Jim, you want to get in on this before we go to yeah. one more question? Yeah, I, I think you know, often when I, when I, I kind of think in a creative way, work, and working with artists actually, I see their process is very different. They can handle complex systems in a way that we can't handle. We, we want to reduce the complex system. And so I think that's what's helped me, is the ability to kind of look at things in you know, this metaphorical different mm. type of space, which is actually more human than you know, this uh, scientific, we're looking at this you know, tiny point type concept, and then try to build it in back from the point. If we look at the whole thing, I think, we can, we, see, we can see down to the point in a different way, and that has inspired me very much. Folks, as I said, we have time for one more. I see there's somebody right back there. Miss, you had your hand up? We'll get over to you. All right. Hi, what's your name? My name's uh, Ilana Gustafson, and uh, I manage a performing arts program at the Natural History Museum. Mm. And uh, I feel like our role is to really just inspire awe in our audiences, which are typically young, but we have many adults too. And so I think um, it's not about giving a bunch of facts as quickly as we can, because you couldn't cover the facts. Um, so I guess my question is, um, how has awe sort of been a role in your coming to where you are? Um, and also how 
it, how does that affect um, people who are not scientists to draw them into science? How does the science art um, bring people in to understanding science? That sense of awe and wonder. Crystal, it's the awe and wonder that got me in this in the first place. I'm ah, a child mm -hmm. of Cosmos, um, uh, the, the, the original 1980 series, and it was that, that awe and that wonder that when I looked up in the sky, in the summer sky, and scanned it with my dad's binoculars, um, you know, just all those stars that must, you know, all those planets that must be out there, um, the, the great stage for the play of life that must be out there. Um, it was that sense of awe that got me into, into the science field in the first place. So, um, you know. Yeah, I, could. I Jim, think when, it, you know, when I was younger, kid, I was going to a museum, which in Glasgow, I was born in Glasgow, and um, it's basically combined art you know, there was all the old masters, Salvador Dali paintings with steam engines and boats because that's the River Clyde. They built all these mm. boats. And so I did. I, that was all for me, both the art and the science. And I always wanted to do both, but I couldn't because in those days you had to make a decision. So today, awe is really important to us. And we run a Sci Art summer school every year at UCLA for two weeks where kids come and they see art, they see science, and nanoscience and so on, and their mission is to imagine the impossible and then present the impossible at the end. And so we try to feed the all back to them. And, you know, I see this coming together of art and science as being a way to actually exp impress these kids because, uh, unfortunately, the traditional science education even this, you know, this, uh, what is it called? St 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 science, technology, engineering, and maths. STEM. Or I, I STEAM. Can't, I, I, I can't really agree with fundamentally. I think it misses mm -hmm. the all part. That's why, you know, they've no. added the A. The now, A. And it's, it's STEAM. Not art, it's all. Art or <laughs> awe, I guess. I, yeah. Chuck, you're an engineer. There's no awe or sense of wonder in that. No, it? no. <laughs> but, I mean, just, I mean, uh, Back in '93, I I was working on the, this this building this detector, and I said it's going to go on the Cassini spacecraft, and it's going to be the camera. So I'm building this stuff, putting it together, and and just to see the images, this thing that I touched is looking at around Saturn right now. Yep. And and ah, it doesn't explain. I mean, right now is the most amazing time to be doing any of this stuff, because we have the tools that we didn't didn't have before. People can see. You know, uh, images from Mars practically live on the web. You know, we, we didn't have that stuff growing up, and and we're so lucky to be in this time right now to, to be able to see all this stuff. The awe age. is big right yeah. now. You know, Crystal, you get the last word on this topic. Well, it'll be a dissenting one. The idea of awe used to make me really grumpy because I thought <laughs> that Sagan ruined it for all of us other scientists and that the astrophysicists and planetary scientists now like owned awe and <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I'm a neuroscientist, but actually Sagan kind of brought that back for me because he has that one quote that's saying that we are the way for the universe to know ourselves. And I was like, aha, he does care about the neuroscientists. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the idea that artists are the only ones that are interested in beauty and elegance is absolutely incorrect. Scientists are looking for that in their work every day. And we're looking at it and trying to find it in nature every day. And those patterns that we keep talking about are beautiful and are elegant. And we should have a sense of awe and wonder whenever we look at them, whether it's an equation or a painting. So that was what I would say. And as my boss at the day job says, uh, the science guy, I am nothing. I am less than a speck of dust in the universe. And yet I have this tool, this tool of tools right up here that allows me to to encompass all of it, which is a, a pretty cool thing. And before we send you out on a very hot day, let's do one other very cool thing and ask Chuck Manning to pick up the saxophone and uh, blow through it for us. OK. I'm going to do that. I'm, I, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, but I realized that uh, I might as well just be, just kind of just do some just something that's going to feel like, like this moment, whatever it is. And I'm not going to know what it is. I'm not going to plan it. Oh, and, and, pure but, jazz. But I'm using a tool that was invented back in the 1860s. Uh, and it's not a very high-tech thing. It's got you know 
pig, no, cow skins and, and felt and, and cork, and it's a piece of brass. And how do you get music out of that? So I don't know. So. All right, so while he goes up there, we will uh, let you know that we are nearing the end of this episode of Next People Science Tomorrow, but it won't be the last. We will be back uh, pretty soon. Keep an eye on scpr.org or kpcc.org, and uh, we hope that you will join us for another one of these events. We're not quite done saying uh, goodbye to our guests, but Chuck, uh, take it away. Ladies and gentlemen, Chuck Manning. An absolute gift at the end of, a, of an afternoon full of gifts, actually. Uh, Chuck, come on back up here because I want to know uh, if you have any gigs coming up that uh, people ought to be looking uh, for you at around Southern California. Well, I do have a website, uh, chuckmanning.com. I'm playing at LACMA, I think, later this month. And uh, uh, I play at this place called Vibrato up in Bel Air. And I played there a couple weeks ago, and Stevie Wonder sat in. So oh, you never good know. Lord. Uh, and what, what should we be looking for coming out of the lab? Well, uh, I think everybody should remember that uh, the JPL uh, Open House is on the 11th and 12th. If you've never done one, you owe it to yourself. And I will be there, so come and say hi. I'll be running the Micro Devices Laboratory website, uh, the, the whole open house there in that building. So All right. That's going to be exciting. Crystal, where can people go to see more of what you're up to, your work? Well, most Saturdays on Al Jazeera America, the science and technology show that I work on, Techno, has a new episode of really interesting new science. Um, and all of us contributors that are in front of the camera, none of us have communication or journalism degrees. We're all scientists and uh, enjoy communicating about what we do. And so that's a really exciting place that you can find me. It's a great feature. I, I highly recommend it. Dan, there's something that we didn't talk about, and we're not going to get to time really to go into it in any detail. But uh, as you know, it fills me with envy. <laughs> when are you likely to make that first trip up into suborbital space? Uh, that's coming up uh, pretty quick. I've got uh, three tickets, so to speak, uh, to space. Three uh, different like, airlines or space yeah, three, lines? Three, yeah, two, well, two, two, well, yeah, three, actually, come to think of it. Um, it's going to be, you know, as soon as they're ready to fly, I'm ready to fly. Uh, another year and a half, two years or so, something like that. Can't wait. Can't wait. Yeah. I hope I'm at least there to greet you when you get back to... Uh, back well, down we're going to be flying out of Mojave. Time. When I first fly, it'll be out of Mojave. So it's, uh, it's, it's not too far from your neighborhood. So uh, Excellent. We'll, have to do a, we'll have to do a live from or something like that. I will be there, I promise. Uh, Jim, you get to wrap this up. What should we be looking forward to in your, your nano world that reveals uh, macro level art? Well, in the, on, on, on the art science side, I think... Science uh, and art. On both at the same time? <laughs> of course. Uh, 
uh, artificial brain. We, were, we yeah, are creating something that will be able to replace your brain in a number <laughs> of years, which may be useful for some people, but <laughs> not the audience here, I'm sure. But anyway. That's one thing, but but more immediately, I think if you look at the if you Google Art Science uh, Center UCLA, what you'll see is we have actually in the laboratory we have a gallery. At the moment, we have a it's a beautiful show of um, a person who has taken silkworm, you know this uh, the silkworm like cocoon, the cocoon, yeah, and they fluoresce differently, oh, and he's yes. made uh, beautiful pieces like that. And look out for these things called lasers. It's a Leonardo kind of meeting artists and scientists, and it's usually accompanied by some wine, people from all these fields talking, and then we have some opening in the gallery. So there's constantly openings to do with art and science, and also you know human, human types of problems um, throughout the year. And Victoria is the one that runs that gallery and runs the whole program, really. I'm a bit lazy. <laughs> another, <laughs> another good reason, though, to visit UCLA. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, what a blast that has, this has been. I hope you agree. Please help me thank our guests, artists one and all, Crystal Dilworth, <laughs> Chuck Manning, Jim Jimsefsky, and Dan Durda. And that is it for this edition of Next. We will be back soon with another foray into the future of science and humanity. Thanks to everybody here at the Crawford Family Forum and Southern California Public Radio, especially my co-producer, Janice Wachee Hurst, the uh, technology guru in the back there, David McKeever, Liz Brown, Haley Waters, and uh, Gabrielle Bernadette Shapiro. The boss here at Southern California Public Radio's Crawford Family Forum, he's highly artistic and always aesthetically pleasing. That's John Cohn. I'm Matt Kaplan. Stay cool, enjoy the rest of the weekend, and enjoy the world of tomorrow. Thanks for coming.